Hey everyone, I'm Sam Shocker and welcome to TYT Interviews in Action. This is a new series that will fall under the TYT Interviews umbrella. It's all about activism, so we'll be interviewing activists, we'll be interviewing celebrities who are activists. It'll be informative and we're going to give you a ton of resources so you can take action at home. Today's show is all about veganism, factory farming, and how adopting a plant-based lifestyle can help you, can help the planet, and help save billions of animals. So without further ado, we have Nathan Runkle, speaker, <coughs> activist, founder and executive director of Mercy for Animals. Thank you so much for being here. And then also we have Moby. We all know Moby is the musician, author, photographer, restaurateur, and vegan. Thank you so much for being here, Moby. My pleasure. And we're missing, we're missing John Sally, but he's on his way. We all know uh, John Sally as an activist. He's also an NBA champion. So John, and he's a health and, and wellness advocate. He's, he's incredible. I've been following his career and his advocacy for years. So hopefully at some point we will see, we will see John join us. So the reason why John and Moby and Nathan, you guys are all united is we have the Circle V Festival coming up, which is on October 23rd. It's an incredible vegan food and music festival and it's at the Fonda. People can get tickets at circlev.com. So Nathan, I know it benefits Mercy for Animals. That's right. And I know it celebrates animal rights, all the funds go to animals, but what what led you to create this festival and how did everybody get involved? Yeah, the festival, as you said, it's a celebration of animal rights. It brings together conscious artists like Moby, world-renowned speakers on animal protection, environmental protection, health, and the future of food, and includes some really, really incredible vegan vendors. So it's a positive, mainstream, fun way to bring attention to a really important cause, which is animal protection. And so, there's, there's performances, there's speakers. Incredible food. Right. Yeah, and this is the inaugural event. Uh, it's only going to grow from here. So cool. And Moby, you, you're performing. This is, this is your only performance this year, right? Yeah, for me, it's like, um, I was going to say killing two birds with one stone, but I don't know if that's necessarily the best analogy I, for I, a vegan I, I, festival. Yes. Saving two birds with one swoop. <laughs> yeah, saving, yeah, saving two birds <laughs> with one perch. Uh, yes. Two th one, I hate touring. Like, really? I really just hate Why? touring. Exhausting um, or? I mean, partially it's, it, it's very repetitive. Like yeah. you go on the road and you're in the same hotel. So I'm not complaining because no one wants to listen to a middle-aged musician <laughs> complain about touring. But like... Same hotels, same venues, same airports. It's just, it's so repetitive. So that's one reason why I don't want to tour anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so this Mercy for Animals Circle V Festival, it's my only show. That's crazy. One, to benefit Mercy for Animals, and two, because I just don't ever want to go on tour. Like, to do a real tour, like, ugh. It's just something I never want to do again. And you, but you have, an, you have a new album coming out, right? On October 14th. And, and that's a really, I was watching your first single and I had a video attached and it, it's, um, mm. it has a, a really important message that is reflective of your advocacy. So when you have this new album, do you think that there will be certain performances that will fall in line with it? I hope not. <laughs> um, and also, I mean, keeping in mind, I'm a 51 year old musician. It's 2016. Yeah. People aren't, I mean, no one buys records. Most people don't listen to albums. Um, so I put out an album because I love making albums, and I hope through making music and having some sort of public forum, I can draw attention to issues that are important to me. But I certainly don't expect too many people to rush out and buy my album the day it's released. If you know, I'd rather they give money to Mercy for Animals cool. and maybe listen to my record on Spotify. When you when you go and perform at uh, Mercy for Animals and at, at for, for Mercy for Animals at Circle V, rather, um, will you be performing from your new album? These systems are failing. Well, it will maybe, be older maybe. music. What do you have? What do you have planned? It'll be like a greatest hit show. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems very self-aggrandizing to talk about myself and say greatest hits. Right. But. How about some of my more well-known songs? Very cool. And uh, because I'm sure we've all had this experience, like you go to see your favorite band or your favorite musician, not implying that I'm anyone's favorite band or musician. You're but many like, people's favorite musician. Absolutely. You're of, many people's kind of favorite music. musician. But uh, like you go to see your favorite band from 20 years ago and they, they get on stage and they say the worst thing that an older musician can ever say. This is a song from our new record. <laughs> And you're like, you're like, oh, I guess that's a chance for me to like check my phone, go to the bathroom. Right. You want to sing the hits along with so them. I might play one or two songs from the new record 
okay. briefly, but it'll mainly be older songs that people know. That's so exciting for the the fans that your fans that will be attending Circle V to to be able to sing some of those hits with you. And then there's other performances too. I know that Davey Havoc and his new band, right, duo, they will be performing. Black Audio is that the mm -hmm. Black Audio will be performing, which has a lot of electronic influence actually. And then who else do you guys and have Cold performing? Cave. Yep, oh, Cold very Cave will also cool. be performing. And yeah. a lot of different speakers, right? We have John speaking, Jane Velez Mitchell. There's a lot of people that will be speaking. Ingrid Newkirk, president. Just met her. Pita. I just we, met her, and she was, she was so sweet. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I wouldn't expect anything less, but yeah. Neil Bernard, founder of Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. We have Uma Valetti, who is with Memphis Meats, which is a clean meat company, so cultured meat, growing meat in a lab environment. Um, Miyoko's from Miyoko's uh, vegan cheese line. Um, really, some of the Don't best, brightest. Kat Von D. Kat Von D. I love Kat. The Kat Von D. Love her. Brilliant. Vegan, yeah. huge animal activist. Mm -hmm. Absolutely adore her. Her makeup, her makeup line too is vegan, and I believe yeah. cruelty yes. free. So, totally, totally cruelty free. Yep, yep. She's she's a big supporter of Mercy mm -hmm. for Animals. Leilani Munter, who's a vegan race car driver. So cool. Yeah, just brilliant, brilliant yeah. speakers and incredible and, food. And also, if you've never had him on your show, I highly recommend that you do. Jamie Kilstein. Yes. Really? Do you know yes. Jamie? No, please he's, inform me. He was Robin Williams' favorite comedian, and wow. he's this. That wonderful, says a lot. crazy vegan activist comedian. And so when we're watching Fox News or looking at the Drudge Report and we're boiling inside, yes, all same. of his comedy is informed by that. So he's kind of like our very funny id. Like the stuff that we don't feel we can say in polite company, he says, and it's really funny. We need to get him on the show, Malcolm. Yeah. Did you hear that? Did you take notes? Yeah, Jamie, okay. Jamie kills we're gonna We're going to work on getting him on the yeah. show. He'll be emceeing the event? He'll be emceeing the event. Yeah. This sounds yeah, like so be, much fun. It's going to be so much fun. Yes, yeah, so if you're in the Southern California area or if you just want to make the trek, make sure yes. you go to circlev.com, get tickets. Also go to mercyforanimals.org because you will, you will learn so much about how incredible you guys are. I am so oh, in debt you. to the work that you thank guys you. do for animals. Thank you. And stick around. We have more coming up. Going vegan. At some point in our lives, we all made that choice to go vegan. Unless, unbeknownst to me, one of you <laughs> grew up vegan. You know, some people grew up that way. But so I wanted us to share our personal stories about why we went vegan, at what yeah. point in our lives that was. And also, I think there's a lot of misconceptions out there. You know, people may think, what does a vegan look like? What do they act <laughs> like? What do they eat? And some people have a negative connotation um, to, to even the word veganism. Mm. And if, if one of you um, out there, um, if that if that relates to you, I, I just beg that you watch this whole interview and um, hopefully we will inform you and hopefully by the end of it, it'll change your mind. So, um, okay, so at what point, uh, Nathan, because I know at 25, first of all, at 25 years old, Nathan is the youngest person to be inducted into the Animal Rights Hall of Fame. That's amazing. So I feel like that you've been at this for a long time, but at what point did you decide to make those choices to become yeah. vegan? So I was born on a small farm in Ohio. So quite the opposite of being raised vegan come from four generations of crop farmers. Both of my uncles were hunters, trappers, fishermen. So I grew up in an environment where it was the norm to use animals for humans. Uh, when I was 11 years old though, I learned about factory farming and I decided that I didn't wanna pay someone to abuse animals on my behalf. And like most people, I grew up with dogs and cats who I considered to be members of our family. Um, and I would see my uncles hunting, trapping, skinning animals alive, scaling fish alive, ripping animals' heads off of their still alive, and it always felt wrong to me as a young child. Um, but no one in my community validated that all animals deserve our respect and consideration, not just our dogs and cats. So when I learned about factory farming, I went vegetarian. This was at 11 years old. Um, and then when I was 15, there was an animal abuse case at our local high school. Um, oh. So there was a Future Farmers of America class, and the teacher of that class was a pig farmer. So it came to the point in the curriculum where they were to do a dissection project. And the teacher decided that he was going to kill baby piglets on his farm to bring to the school for this dissection project. Now, this morning he arrived, but one of the piglets was still alive. Oh my God. And was standing on top of the other piglets in this bucket. A student in the class took this piglet by her hind legs and slammed her what? head first into the ground. Um, this piglet still didn't die. She had a fractured skull. She was bleeding out of the mouth in horrible distress. 
Other students grabbed this dying piglet, left the classroom, went to another teacher who was known as the vegetarian who cared about animals. She went to the local vet and had this piglet euthanized. And then she went to the sheriff and filed an animal cruelty complaint. And animal cruelty charges were filed. Uh, it went to court and the very first day of that trial, those cruelty charges were dismissed because it's considered standard agricultural practice to slam baby piglets head first into the ground. Wow. It's called thumping. It's an inexpensive way of killing piglets, but as this case illustrated, it can cause prolonged, horrible, horrible suffering. And clearly if this had been a puppy that was slammed head first into the ground, right. the cruelty prosecution, psychiatric evaluation, you know, a ban of ever working with animals again would have happened. So Possibly this, losing his job as a teacher. It, absolutely. Yep. So this was 17 years ago, and it was that case that um, compelled me to start Mercy for Animals in this small farming community. Wow. Incredible. Wow, yeah. that's, a, that's a really tough hmm. story to listen to, but it impacts you. Uh, Moby, at what age did you decide to become vegan, or was it vegetarian at first? Well, I've been a vegan now for 29 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, like most people, I grew up in that sort of strange paradox of loving animals and eating animals. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in suburban Connecticut and we had lots of rescue dogs and cats and iguanas and I loved them unconditionally. But I also loved Burger King and McDonald's and I never really thought about it. And then I had this, what I think of my like Saul on the road to Damascus epiphany, I was petting a rescue cat of mine named Tucker. And Tucker was the sweetest cat you've ever met, like with this incredibly rich emotional life. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden I realized Tucker, my, the love of my life, this cat has two eyes and a central nervous system and a profoundly rich emotional life and a desire to avoid pain and suffering. And a little switch got thrown in my head and I realized, oh, Every creature with two eyes and a central nervous system has a rich emotional life and a desire to avoid pain and suffering. And that was in 1984, 85. Wow. So I became a vegetarian then, and then soon after became a vegan. So the core of my veganism is a love for animals and a simple belief that animals are not property. You know, mm -hmm. like every animal has its own life, its own rights, its own will. But then as time has passed, my veganism and my activism has been informed by climate change. Mm -hmm. I mean, up to 50% of climate change comes from animal agriculture. Mm -hmm. Famine, 100% of famine comes from animal agriculture. And if you're interested as to why that's the case, I'm happy to explain more. Mm -hmm. um, rainforest deforestation, 75%. Mm -hmm. Antibiotic resistance, 75%. So like, as progressives, we look at our progressive basket of issues and we realize animal agriculture in, informs and touches almost all of them. So yeah, so at the core of it, it's a love of animals, but it's also very much in service of all my other like progressive ideas. Exactly, and I think yeah. it kind of fell in line with me too. That for me, it was about 13 years ago, I went vegetarian and for me, it was at the end of high school, beginning college, and uh, I was actually inspired by a lot of the musicians I looked up to. Mm -hmm. You were one of them, as well as Ian MacKay from Minor Threat. He was mm -hmm. vegetarian. Davey Havoc was one of them, Joan Jett. And so for me, um, that's why I think it's so important that um, that we have these activists that have a big platform because they do they do influence people. So I would Absolutely. go to different music festivals and PETA mm -hmm. too would be there and they'd be passing out pamphlets. And I was unaware because I loved animals, but I also ate meat. I loved mm -hmm. meat. So I wasn't aware of like the harsh realities that were happening within fa factory farming. And I would yeah. read these sobering statistics and I was like, whoa, which led me to watch some of the footage. And later mm -hmm. um, we're gonna actually watch some footage, but it's so important to have that because some of us are, are, are completely clueless yeah. of the suffering and, um, and not only how it impacts, how factory farming impacts the animals, but as you said, Moby, the environment. Mm -hmm. So like the single best thing that you can do to help the environment and help animals and your health is to adopt a plant-based diet. And I was mm -hmm. able to learn all that, thank God, um, you know, 13 years ago. And then it took me about a year to become vegan. It took me a year to start to decide, okay, how do I eliminate dairy and how do I, and then where do you guys draw the line? So for me, then I was like, oh, I 
started to look at my household uh, products. I said, okay, that's tested on animals, or there's an animal byproduct there, and I had to clean house there. Same with like cosmetics. And uh, for you at home, there's a there's a fantastic website called leapingbunny.org, and it will show you all the different products out there that are cruelty free, and and they're great products, products that you probably already use, products that are available at CVS or Sephora or Rite Aid. So, um, but at what point did you guys have to like draw the line, and at what point do you decide? Um, you know, I guess like baseball mitts, you know, they're yeah. made out of leather, <clears throat> footballs. So, so where do you draw that line? I think it's important to understand that veganism is a tool to prevent animal cruelty. Uh, for me, it's not about purity. Um, and for people that are thinking about going vegan, they should lean into it. They should be patient with themselves. They should start crowding out the meat, dairy, and eggs with plant-based alternatives. Um, you know, if, if everyone went meatless just on Monday, for example, over a billion animals would be spared wow. the horrors of factory farming in the United States every year. Wow. So just once a year. That's a really powerful yeah, statistic. A billion animals a year if okay. people just went meatless, meatless Mondays, on Monday. Meatless Mondays. Yeah. So I think some people hear about veganism and they say, I could never do this. Right. Well, start on Monday, then add Tuesday, you know, ease into it. And what I have seen is that most people, they feel better, not only physically, but they also feel better knowing that they're not supporting horrible animal abuse, the degradation of the environment. Um, so yeah, ease into it. People can go to chooseveg.com. We have a website where they can get a, a vegetarian Fantastic. starter guide. Fantastic. There are so many resources out there. And also, as far as where we draw the line, um, I mean, as we all know, especially in the world of progressive politics and progressive movements, we're sometimes guilty of being in like a holier than thou circular mm. firing squad. Uh, you know, where suddenly like you're criticizing people with whom you agree. Right. You know, I mean, we saw it with like Bernie and Hillary, you know, like Bernie supporters saying, but Hillary voted for the war. I was like, have you looked at the opposition? Right. Have you looked at the Republicans? Like, right. we don't have the luxury of infighting. You know, infighting to me is just like a product of like a, dimin like a diminished worldview and ignorance. Mm -hmm. You know, and the same thing with the world of veganism. Like, if I see a vegan, who happens to be wearing leather shoes, mm -hmm. you know, in the grand scheme of things, it's not great, but compare that to like CAFOs and factory farms and animal abuse and the subsidies that go to animal agriculture. Like we have a job and it's not criticizing each other. I agree. Yeah. And what about some of like the social impact? Meaning um, when you guys first decided to become vegan or even now, do you find that certain people will, will judge you? How are your, have your friends and family mm -hmm. been supportive? Your fans been supportive? Well, I, I mean, I've been a vegan now for 29 years. So when I first became vegan, no one even knew how to pronounce vegan. They're like, <laughs> is it vegan? Is it vegan? And it was pretty obscure and it's been incredibly heartening to see the growth of the vegan movement. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, Bill Clinton is primarily vegan. Mm -hmm. Al Gore is primarily mm -hmm. vegan. Oprah's primarily vegan. Like, like 29 years ago, m me and the Phoenixes, as far as I know, <laughs> like and Gene Bauer from <laughs> right. Farm Sanctuary, like they're just, veganism really wasn't right. a thing. So it's right. been really encouraging Absolutely. to see the growth. In fact, um, uh, later today, I'm having dinner with Cory Booker, mm -hmm. our vegan senator mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's that, the famous Martin Luther King Jr. quote of, you know, the moral arc of the universe is mm -hmm. long and it bends towards justice. You quoted that yeah. at the Mercy for Animals gal Gala. And I think it bends towards justice, but it also bends towards progress and reason. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you look at human history from the Magna Carta on, like there's this steady extension of rights to more and more people and more and more creatures. Yeah. And I just see that rationally continuing. Right. You know, we're like, in the future, people will look back and say like, what? Like you tortured and killed animals, which tortured and killed the animals, but also compromised the environment and decimated human health. Like simply to saying like, what the fuck were you doing? Right, like, such a disconnect, yeah. such a disconnect. Yeah. Um, we have to move on, but quickly, uh, what are some of the, the links that we can give? So we have the one that you mentioned. Yep. Chooseveg.com. Chooseveg.com, mercyforanimals.org, has yep. a lot of great resources. Uh, Moby, any advice that you could give to viewers at home who are considering adopting even just a, a little it, bit of a plant-based diet? Um, I guess it's the famous Voltaire quote that Obama paraphrased in his first inaugural address, which is, don't let the perfect be the enemy mm -hmm. of the good. Absolutely. You know, like say doing 10 good things is great. 
you know, and you have to start somewhere. Yes, we're yeah. going to leave it on that note. All right, before we get into factory farming and the harsh and sad reality that a lot of animals face and how it also impacts the environment and our health, we have we have a new guest here. We have we have four-time NBA champion and vegan and advocate and talk show host John yeah, Sally. I was here. You just wasn't you wasn't talking to me. Oh, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. You can't I just miss faded you. in. I had to put a gray shirt on just so you would <laughs> see that I was here. And you you came at a time where it's gonna get it's gonna get um, tough. Yeah. Because we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna start with some footage in just a moment of of as I said earlier the harsh realities of factory farming. But then we're gonna have some heartwarming footage. We're gonna play a game. We're gonna learn a little bit more about you. So stay tuned for that. But before we get into this video, I just want to warn the viewers: it is graphic. It is very hard to watch. But I think it's important that people watch it because ignorance yeah. is is not bliss. <clears throat> and I think it's necessary to be informed, Are you especially. The debate? Oh, it's. That it's is worse. really hard to watch. That yeah, is worse. very hard yeah. to watch. That's 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 a whole another discussion. At least this would be the truth. Yeah, you'll have to come back when we talk debates. Yeah. Um, all right, so let's take a look at this footage. I think it's it's just under a minute. So please, please, please do everything you can to watch it, and then we will discuss. The birds are dragged through an electrified vat of water, which renders them paralyzed, but not necessarily unconscious. They are then pulled across a blade, which slices their throats, causing blood to pour from their necks. Cows too sick or injured to stand are called downers and are often left to slowly suffer and die from their injuries. Calves on dairy farms are dragged away from their mothers and violently killed, all so that humans can have the milk instead. Piglets who become sick or injured or who are not growing quickly enough are killed. Common killing methods include being slammed head first into the ground. Pigs are knocked in the head with a steel rod, hung upside down and have their throats slit. Proper stunning condemns many pigs to having their throats slit while they are fully conscious and suffering. Oh my God, I've seen footage like this a, a gazillion mm. times and it's still just, still so hard so to watch. There's one aspect, there, there are two great things about what we just saw. Okay. One, it inspires us to work harder. You know, like when I watch that footage, I'm like, this is my life's work. You know, like, the other thing is, I was talking to a friend of mine who worked at um, Humane Society, and this might sound a little odd, when I watch animals being killed, my response is actually to say thank you, because it's the only mercy that that animal's ever going to be shown. Like once it's dead, it doesn't suffer anymore. And I'm not advocating killing, but I'm saying like when I see a cow or a pig and it's dying, I'm like, finally, the suffering's over. You know, so it's the only good thing that can come from that. Yeah, it's so hard. It's so hard to watch. But I have to believe that because uh, we were all meat eaters at one point. I have to believe that um, the majority of meat eaters out there they don't they're not aware of these harsh realities. So it's so important to have footage like this. That's what turned me into vegan. So mm -hmm. Nathan, with Mercy for Animals, you guys work with a lot of this investigative footage, That's right. and you use it to educate people and inform. So how how hard is it to get this footage? Number one and number two. Are you guys stopped by the meat in industry? Because I can imagine that they don't want this footage to get out. Yeah, that's right. They don't want people to see how their food is being produced because as you saw, it's horrific. It goes completely against what most Americans' ethics and values are, which is not to support cruelty to animals. We've done over 50 undercover investigations into egg farms, dairy farm, pig farms, slaughterhouses. Every single time, without exception, that we enter these facilities, we see animals locked in cages where they can't turn around, having their throats slit while fully conscious, mutilated without painkillers. This is the standard for the industry. Sometimes people see this footage and they want to believe that this is the bad apple, this is the exception. That's not the case. It is becoming more difficult to do these investigations. The meat industry is pushing what are called ag-gag laws that make it a crime to take video or photographs inside of factory farms. Oh, that's bullshit. And in some, in some situations, the penalty for taking a photograph of someone abusing an animal on a factory farm is harsher than actually abusing the animals. Wow. Yeah, it's outrageous. And John, uh, we, we didn't get to, so the viewer knows, um, how long have you been vegan? And I think for you, a lot of people may be surprised that a professional athlete mm -hmm. is a vegan. So if you could talk about all of that and then also please reflect on the video. Well, I, it's been eight years now. 
I was a lying vegetarian since 91. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, you vegetarians that say, I just eat fish, you're not a vegetarian. And, and then I would have turkey and, and, or, or shrimp. So I was a lying vegetarian. So when I became a vegetarian, I would say a real vegetarian, which is a vegan, I would say about 10 years ago, but I became a vegan eight years ago where I became more conscious of what I do, how it affects things. And that's really what it, that part of veganism. And for you, it's also been about health, right? Because yeah. you're a big health and wellness advocate. Right. So I became a health coach, and then I, and now I have a, a system that I will be you know, talking about right here on Young Turks. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, making more health coaches because I realize... Like, when I'm around these two guys, it, you can hear Moby speak and whatnot, and you, you'll see it. But then when, like I told him, when I started seeing that he started taking processes in his life, not just like some people preach it and live another way. He Like like he said, his life's work. And then Lives Nathan, by example. Like, I literally, my hair was like Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> and then this happened. Yeah. <laughs> so, see, me and Moby yeah. both try to be like Nathan <laughs> in so many ways. But that mentality of what can I do to be the best human I could be. So I decided yeah. with Health Coach Institute to make people more conscious, teach them. Right. Not just, not just about food and what, like literally teach them. And then when you become conscious, you help the next person. After, if pay, pay it forward. And before we get into some of the, some mm -hmm. really sober, sobering statistics, you mentioned um, some of them in regard to factory farming and the environment, but just your health. I mean, yeah. there's, there's so many studies out there that show that by adopting a plant-based lifestyle, you increase your lifespan. Yeah. It, it helps you fight against disease and cancer and you're less susceptible to develop those diseases. You become more compassionate. You become more compassionate, you're happier. But um, so that's one benefit. Let's take a look at some of the graphics that go through the, the benefits um, when it comes to the environment. Adopting a plant-based diet saves eight plus animals a month, 100 plus animals per year, 300 plus animals in three years. So that has to do with uh, saving animals, which is, those are, that's, that's just you adopting a plant-based diet, you are saving animals' lives. Now, livestock and their byproducts account for at least 32,000 million tons of CO2 per year, or 51% of all worldwide greenhouse gas emissions. Now, you compare that to transportation, because a lot of people will say, oh, what about the pollution? All the pollution from transportation is, is much more of a, a greenhouse gas emission. Actually, road, rail, air, and marine only accounts for 13%. You compare that with the 51%. Oh, this is a good one, because you may have seen a number of articles out there that will criticize a plant-based diet because of the water consumption used to produce mm -hmm. almonds. So let's compare the water <laughs> used to produce almonds to 240 uh, eggs per year, 12,985 gallons of water. That's in comparison to 736 almonds per year. That's 736 gallons of water. And then 144 hamburgers per year. That's 102,960 gallons of water. That's what the average American eats. And that's just looking at, at a pound of beef. That's just looking at hamburger meat, not to think about how much water it takes for a pound of, of chicken, of turkey, of a carton of eggs. So I think it's important to push that because I have just been wanting to pull my hair out when I read these articles that talk about water consumption and almonds. Well, but then that's, they don't. That's why John and I are bold. Yeah, we've been pulling our hair out. Don't do it. <laughs> one, of the things, one of the things that's been frustrating when we're talking about these statistics, it's like the meat industry will sometimes grudgingly say, oh yeah, it's about a thousand gallons of water to make one pound of beef. I'm like, no, that's the amount of water fed to the cow. Mm. What about the amount of water that goes to the alfalfa, the soy, the corn? What about the amount of water that's used to like hose down the feedlots? Like it's closer to 10,000 gallons of water for one pound of beef. And the same thing with CO2 emissions. You're not talking about methane. Methane is 10 times more powerful of a climate change gas than CO2. And even the beef industry will say like, oh yeah, it's like 20% of climate change. They downplay it. That's direct emissions. You're not talking again about all the, like the rainforest being decimated to um, either yeah. create grazing land for livestock or to grow pro you know, crops for livestock. So there are these knock on consequences and what, I know that, I mean, I love TYT mm -hmm. and I love how staunchly progressive it is. I'm amazed that there's any progressive on the planet who supports animal agriculture. I yeah. agree. You know, it's like being progressive and supporting animal agriculture is like being a lung cancer activist and smoking. 
Absolutely. We have a great graphic to go along with what you just mentioned with animal agriculture. And Don't you the, love Moby? I love I Moby. Trust, I've always loved Moby. <laughs> now he's here. Man. Let's look at the graphic. Animal agriculture yeah. is responsible for up to 91% of Amazon destruction. Earth's rainforests are being destroyed at the rate of 1.4 acres per second worldwide. When people yeah. think about what's happening to endangered species, people think about rhinos, they think about elephants. and. It's, it's hard to think of what we can do in our everyday life to help those animals, but when you look at how many animals species are being completely wiped out, it's because of the destruction of the rainforest, and that is directly associated with the consumption of animal products. So there's so many things that are going on in our world that seem out of reach for us to have an impact on, but climate change, uh, the decimation of endangered species, all of these things, we can help be part of the solution every time that we sit down to eat. That's so powerful. And then also, I think a lot of people may be unaware of uh, a lot of the workers yeah. that work in these yeah. factory farms. We have some really powerful quotes that may give you a better idea of what they go through and the conditions that they have. So a job at a factory farm has one of the largest turnover rates in America, exceeding 95 to 100% yep. annually. Also, statistically, these workers come from low-income families with yep. approximately 72% born outside the U.S. and 68% born in Mexico. The poor working conditions, you talked about that. Yep. Um, long hours, They because a lot of them are undocumented, yep. they aren't able to unionize, so of mm -hmm. course they get taken advantage of. And then also a lot of worker death, a lot of injuries. According to the CDC, there were 20.2 deaths per 100,000 workers. Workers. And then there are a number of injuries, a number of unreported injuries, because they're afraid to ruffle any feathers because even though there's a high turnover rate, they don't want to lose their job, right? Well, in, in Tyson Foods, the largest poultry company in the U.S., they publicly admit that they have one amputation per month at their slaughterhouses because of worker um, accidents. Unbelievable. That's Tyson. So somebody loses a finger, a hand, an arm, a toe, an yeah. ear, a nose. Yep. Yeah. Every month, and then it gets ground up, in the, and and they can't find it. Possibly, but they still pack well, it. Possibly, maybe. You. So I'm just saying. I'm not saying that's what happens. I'm just saying yeah. sometimes <laughs> all you people eating the sausage may have a finger of a Mexican dude with a ring on it. It's pretty much a given. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And then also the no regulation, as I stated, it affects a, a lot of the neighboring communities. So because the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency doesn't regulate the air and water pollution created by factory farms, they are allowed to spray this waste on surrounding lands that are usually near people's homes. The toxins and harmful gases released from this waste cause people to suffer from respiratory infections, headaches, and can even cause blue baby syndrome if it enters the waterways. And what's sad is many of these communities, I read their pleas, many of these communities yeah. will come together, they'll call for regulation, it falls on deaf ears, but then because of their financial situation, they can't move. So yeah. they're left to endure the the terrible health conditions that could impact on, on their family. Or be afraid of Zika. Yeah. Like in Florida, they're going to tell you about Zika. But they, mm -hmm. you had to just tell me yeah. about this. Right. Right? They're afraid of Zika. They're afraid of everything in the world that they can put on certain networks to make you afraid. But that's so you don't pay attention. To this. It's like this, like the one time somebody said, you don't, they put sports on and they make it a big important thing. So you're not paying attention to the fact that they're killing you. Oh, wow. Um, so if, if any of this footage in our conversation has impacted you, I, I encourage you to learn more. Go to mercyforanimals.org. You'll find all the information there. But And donate. And donate. Believe me, all the money goes directly to fighting for animal rights. And then soon we're going to have some heartwarming footage. So you can look forward to that. Puppies. All right, after watching some of the horrors of the factory farming industry, some very hard to digest footage, we are going to supplement that with some really heartwarming footage. So I had the opportunity to visit the Gentle Barn, which is an incredible farm here in the greater Los Angeles area. And I met with one of the founders, her name is Ellie, watch. Hey everyone, Sam Shocker here. And today we are at the Gentle Barn, my favorite place to visit here in Los Angeles and to support. It is an incredible nonprofit that helps rescue and rehabilitate severely abused animals. And it uses animal interaction to help special needs children, at risk youth, and to teach empathy and compassion to everyone who visits. So they're doing a lot of good here to say the least. And today we're gonna give you an inside look. Stay with us. They're excited, can you hear them? I love all the open space that they have. Yeah, and they run around in the mornings when it's cooler. Who's this guy? That's King. Hi, That's King! Awesome. We rescue animals that are too old, too sick, too lame, or too scared to be adoptable by anyone else. And we rehabilitate them and give them sanctuary here for the rest of their lives. This is one of the pigs. 
every time I visit Biscuit, this chicken's here. So are they friends? The chickens always hang out with the pigs. That's so yeah. funny. I love you, Biscuit. Bye, Biscuit. When I was a kid, I felt very lonely, and I felt like I didn't fit in, and it was always animals in my darkest times that brought me back to life. Ellie is in a trance. She's getting a lot of love from Buttercup. So I know firsthand the healing properties that animals have, that they could really fill you with worth and unconditional love. She's full on cuddling you right now. So she was rescued from Thanksgiving last year. Um, every year for Thanksgiving, we find a place that's going to sell their turkeys for slaughter and we rescue some and bring them home. They were terrified of people. Of course. And here they are in our laps. So it was always the goal of the Gentle Barn to do two things. One is to rescue animals that nobody else wants and give them sanctuary and rehabilitate them and let them know that they have value. And then when they're ready, have the animals help us heal people with the same stories of abuse and neglect and remind them that they have value. <laughs> I think the turkeys would like to be interviewed also. These children are gonna grow up and be the next generation. And this environment and this planet and the animals are gonna be in their hands. If they're connected to it, they'll do right by it. If they're not connected to it, it's only gonna keep getting worse. When we operate from greed and violence and domination and what feels good for us right now and not thinking about the future and not thinking about others, that is gonna to lead to illness, to pain and suffering, and to the destruction of this environment. But when we operate from gentleness and kindness and peace and love and reverence for other beings and for all beings, then all of a sudden our bodies are healthy, we are surrounded by neighbors that are happy and healthy as well, and the environment and this planet flourish. <laughs> I'm so happy right now. I am fully sandwiched by two loving cows. Honestly, the greatest thing that people can do to support us is to adopt a plant-based diet. When one person adopts a plant-based diet, they save 198 animals every year. They also save an acre of trees every year, and they also save 600 gallons of water a day. Wow! Not to mention the health benefits. When you're informed and when you're educated, then that breeds empathy. And I think then that breeds action. You've come a long way. And I think that's exactly what I'm seeing here at the Gentle Barn. That's why it's so important. And I'm so glad that we were able to be here today. So touching. And it just shows that there's so many people out there, including yourselves, including Mercy for Animals, that, including Gentle Barn, that are doing right by animals. And I think we need to <laughs> look at your face. <laughs> You're part of that team. I, I, you I, are part of that team. I tell, I tell, don't I, every time I do something for him or with him or with those people, like, that's why I busted my butt to get here. I really appreciate this dude. And I told him that. I said, man, you know, a lot of guys can just be an international model and just go off. And but you use your model money and all your good looks. <laughs> yeah. Model money. You yeah. use all your good looks just to know. But I, I say that. I just yeah. think that it's amazing that they're dedicated to thank doing something like God, that. Thank God. Thank right. God. And if uh, there was one part in the video that you weren't able to hear, but in the audio, uh, Ellie talked about the assessment, her assessment was at the Gentle Barn, they teach compassion to mm. animals and they invite the public to come in and learn empathy and learn compassion. And they and they also use, once the animals are rehabilitated, it could take some some time, but once the animals are rehabilitated, they use that animal interaction with, with children, at-risk yeah. youth and, and special needs mm -hmm. kids to, to help them heal as well. So what do you guys think about that assessment? Well, I had an experience recently. I went to another animal sanctuary, farm sanctuary. Yes. And as I said, I've been a vegan for 29 years and I love animals, but I live in an urban environment and I rarely get to see animals in person. And I went to this farm sanctuary and I saw this cow named Paolo. Mm -hmm. And I looked in Paolo's eyes and all of a sudden I was like, oh, he's an individual. Like I, mm -hmm. I sort of, you forget, like, cause we're, we don't actually, like we, we go online, we read information, we look at videos, but actually seeing an animal in person, looking in its eyes mm -hmm. and you realize, they have their own life. They have their own wills. They have their own rights. Like feelings. It's they not have an, feelings. It's not an abstraction. Right. Yeah. You know, it's these each animal is an individual with a profound emotional life and a profound ability to feel intense pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. And it's this thing that I keep coming up against that makes me not a huge fan of our species is that like what does it say about us that we're we're confronted with defenseless, vulnerable animals, we harm them. Right. Like there's no greater indictment of us as a species than that simple fact. Like the correct response to something that's defenseless and vulnerable is protect it, mm -hmm. take care of it, 
extend kindness to it. You don't torture it. But to some people, they think they do when it comes to, like we talked about earlier, cats and dogs. Mm -hmm. So why do you think there is a disconnect when it comes to tr having compassion towards our pets and a farm animal? Per se. I think part of it is people don't know cows, pigs, and chickens. People mm -hmm. share their homes with dogs and cats. So as Moby said, we know them as individuals. We know that they have a sense of humor, that they have wants and needs, and they have best friends. It's the same with farm animals, but they are so absent from our view. Most people will never meet a cow or a pig or a chicken. And, and pigs are actually more intelligent than dogs. Mm -hmm. Uh, when we when we look at these creatures, they are just so fascinating. They value relationships with their families. They do everything they can to avoid harm. Um, and you know, as Moby was saying, I think how we treat the most vulnerable among us says a whole lot about who we are as people. And it's hard to imagine a group more vulnerable to cruelty and exploitation than farm animals. Yes. Another problem yep. is uh, I don't think people understand dogs and cats. This is what I said, because I remember I saw back in the day, somebody was wearing a coyote coat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a dog. Yeah, right? right. And then they sit around and they wear a fox. That's, that's a dog. And then I see people go and kill big cats. Right. right, they kill big cats and then they have it laid out and they think that it's makes a, it. They think it's a rug. But it's a cat, right? right? They don't get it. Right, yeah. And not until, and even if they were eating dog and cat, which pretty soon they probably will to start thinking about how to do that. They're going to, we have to get inside of their brain in a different way. My daughter Tyler is with me now. She was 13 when we watched Earthlings. I didn't know Earthlings were going to, I just, you know, I thought it was, I didn't know. Yeah. And she watched Earthlings and I'm watching her cry. Powerful film. Right. But, uh, you know, uh, to me, I'm like, oh, did I make you feel bad? And then I saw her cry at the notebook, so she just cries. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I'm just same. But what it did is it established that never can you go into a place and go, oh, it's just one shrimp. Right. Like I established with my daughter from an early age, this is not acceptable. This is wrong. This is not to be done. And a lot of people don't do that. And a lot of people like they do the same thing when they have. The, I, I say to people when they have a baby, you breastfeed. Oh my God, I couldn't really latch on. Only six months, and then I gave it a cow's milk. Right. That that is. We're I not, said, but yeah. she's not a cow. You know, they they just don't. They're gonna get it. Right. They're gonna get it because they're gonna start watching. When you do any of this thing, it's a dog and a cat. So when you see him with a chicken, if you see him with beef, if you see him with pork, just tell them it's a dog and a cat. Right. Their brain then slows down. And I think too, to have more uh, farms like this, rescue farms, like Farm Sanctuary and Gentle Barn. So mm -hmm. please visit a farm sanctuary near you. If you're in the LA area, the Tennessee area, go to Gentle Barn, go to gentlebarn.org. It's an incredible organization. You can actually donate and sponsor an animal right now. Right now they are sponsoring turkeys mm -hmm. because of Thanksgiving and a lot of turkeys get slaughtered. Um, for the Thanksgiving holiday. The beautiful thing about sanctuaries is these animals really serve as ambassadors mm -hmm. for all the other animals that are suffering on factory farms. The truth is we can't rescue our way out of this situation. Nine billion animals in the US killed every year. We have to address it at its root cause, which is people eating these meat, dairy, and egg products. And I, would, I completely agree. Um, I put out a book a few years ago called Gristle, mm -hmm. and it's about the consequences of factory farming. And when I did the book tour, there was this recurring question um, and a very legitimate question, people would say like, oh, but animal products are inexpensive, mm. you know? And I was like, there's a reason why animal products are inexpensive, subsidies. We subsidize, our tax dollars subsidize every aspect of animal agriculture and animal production. Without federal and local subsidies, a pound of beef would cost around $40, a gallon of milk would cost around $15, a family of four going to McDonald's without subsidized food would be spending around $90. So really one thing that I'm hoping we can do over time is stop subsidizing animal agriculture which kills people, kills animals, destroys the environment, destroys local communities, harms workers, and it's all subsidized by our tax dollars. And we all can uh, make a difference mm -hmm. just by adopting a plant-based diet. It's game time! We have to have some fun, right? Yeah. It's game time! I don't know what this is, but, and I know that, I know that, that you're competitive. I'm yeah. sure, are, are you guys competitive? Are you hoping to win the game? See, yes. here's the thing. I think yes? That, yes. Like, we're, we're all kind of like, 
gentle progressive. Okay. But deep down, I'm gonna fucking crush we you. Yes. Wanna win. We wanna win. I <laughs> wish that I could like compete, but I know all the answers, so that doesn't count. So it's a very simple game. It's called Spot the Vegan, and we okay. will show you pictures of different really well-known vegans. You're you're spotting two right now. Here's one as well. Up. Yeah. <laughs> and so we'll show you uh, a, a, an image of three different very well-known vegans, and then we'll play a number of different rounds. You have to spot the vegan, and there's a number of celebrities and well-known people out there that have adopted a plant-based diet for a variety of reasons. But I think a lot of people out there don't know that they are vegan. And maybe you all well, don't know either. Because also there's that okay. fear. I a know. lot of public figures are like, oh, I don't want to hurt my public figure right. status. And from my perspective, the only good use of public figure status mm. is trying to make the world a better place. Yeah. Like, yeah, you you influenced me. You influenced me to well, go I, vegetarian years ago. I just you and Ian Mackay. Okay, so shall we look at? Let's play the very first round. So oh. we have presidents. Okay, so we have Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush. This one's pretty easy. Bill Clinton, right? I mean, we're yeah. yeah. This is how we. This let's is how we, let's read a quote right? yeah. from Bill Clinton <laughs> as to why he went vegan. So Bill says, quote, I stopped eating meat, cheese, milk, even fish, no dairy at all. I just decided that I was a high risk person and I didn't want to fool with this anymore. And I wanted to live to be a grandfather. So I decided to pick the diet that I thought would maximize my chances of long term survival. All right, let's go to the next category. These are female artists. We've got Ariana Grande, Megan Trainer, or Rihanna. Which Ariana one is Grande. the vegan? Ariana Grande. Dang, Ariana Grande, I wonder yeah. if, the, if I, hopefully the viewers at home are, are, are stumped. But I tried like to get Rihanna though. I went to Rihanna at the did. concert and I said, hey, I, you know, trying to, she said, okay, what do you want to talk about? I said, um, I hear you don't eat green. She goes, I ate, I'm eating salad. I'm getting better. She's getting better. She's getting better. So I'm trying to, because my yeah, my daughter loves her. I want, I want the princess, queen, whatever y'all want to call her, yeah. to mm -hmm. live forever. Yes. And keep that sexy going. Keep yeah. keep telling her. I know you, I you tried yeah. to influence Michelle Obama too. I try to influence everyone. Yes. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> yes. um, let me read you Ariana's <laughs> quote. Ariana says, I love animals more than I love most people. I'm not kidding. But I am a firm believer in eating a full plant-based whole food diet that can expand your life length and make you an all-around happier person. I was raised on meat and cheese, so I've had enough for anyone's normal <laughs> life span. All right, the next category we have directors. So we have James Cameron. Okay, James, oh James Cameron, Spike Lee, Quentin Tarantino. You guys have already guessed. Right. Yeah. James Cameron, the winner is James, James Cameron. Cameron. Let's read his quote. He says, it's not a requirement to eat animals. We just choose to do it. So it becomes a moral choice and one that is having a huge impact on the planet, using up resources and destroying the biosphere. We'll do one more category. This is a Game of, the, a game of Thrones category. Peter so, Dinklage. Yeah. No! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we have Peter Dinklage, Amelia Clark, or Kit Harrington. Our panel is too oh. good. The winner is... And yes. Moby's right. Peter Dinklage, he says, quote, I like animals, all animals. I wouldn't hurt a cat or a dog or a chicken or a cow, and I wouldn't ask someone else to hurt them for me. This is why I am vegetarian. Wow. Uh, so that's it for us today. I'm so grateful that all of you have been able to share your experiences, and I'm just so well, in debt to you, all of you for your you activism. For doing this. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, part two and part three. We yes. could go on and on and on. We <laughs> should go on and on. Yeah, and on. we didn't get to touch upon, you know, wool and 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 down feathers well, and there's so there, much uh, so much animal cruelty out there that we weren't able to talk about. But it's I think especially encouraging because, like, as I said, I've been a vegan for 29 years and a very progressive left wing Democrat for a very long time, and it's been so frustrating in the environmental community, in the progressive political community how blind people are to the consequences of animal agriculture. And what I would say to anybody, I'm looking at the camera because that's a professional mm -hmm. thing to do, right? <laughs> Is what choices can you make that are actually in keeping with your values? You know, we need to make choices that are accordance, in accordance with our values. Amen. Amen. And in the meantime, you can go to mercyforanimals.org. A lot of information. I know your website, too, has a lot yep. of information for a plant-based diet. Mostly everything for Mercy for Animals. <laughs> yeah. PCR. Hey, Moby, your new album speaks to that. Your yeah. new album, yeah. which comes out October 14th, it speaks just to that, which I think is phenomenal. And I would like to encourage people not to pay for it, but rather give money to Mercy for Animals. That's incredible. Like steal the record. You give see money how, to how incredible these people are? And then I also <laughs> want to... Did he promote to... pirating just now? He just yeah, said steal my... <laughs> <laughs> uh, pirate just... music. 
that give money to charity. Yes, <laughs> yes. And then also the Circle V Festival. So yes. again, October 23rd, go to CircleV.com to get your tickets. And we're going to leave you. Yes, I, I'm going to be there. I can't yes. wait. And we're going to leave you with a really heartwarming video. This is a new video from The Gentle Barn. No one has seen it. And they have a lot of followers. If you go on their social media, they have a ton of followers. They're always excited to see these new uh, touching videos. And we have their very newest of the videos. Um, it's an exclusive, so we're gonna leave you with that. And thank you again to The Gentle Barn as well. So there's a moment where the baby comes out. She still hasn't taken her first breath and they lay very, very still and quiet until the mom starts licking them and clearing them. And then the baby will start to move a little bit. She immediately wants to put all her energy and all her love and all her focus on that baby to make sure the baby's healthy and strong and loved and they get to bond on each other. About 45 minutes after she was born, she's already going forward onto her knees trying to stand up, which is amazing. And then there's this period where they try to stand, but they're very, very wobbly, so they keep standing and falling down, or taking a step and then falling down. And they have to figure out um, where to nurse from. And that process takes forever. And the mom is begging for it. Maybell was making these little mooing sounds to the baby, like, come on, come on and nurse. But the baby's gotta figure out where it is. And so it feels like that moment takes forever. But then finally, she found it and she latched on for the first time and she was able to suckle for a nice long time, get her belly full. We wanted this bonding moment to be really special for Maybelle because she has experienced all her babies being taken away over the course of her lifetime as a dairy cow. This is the first baby that she's ever had that will never be taken away from her.